Hi, welcome. My name is Karen Altus. I'm a career counselor here at the Center for Career and Calling. Um, welcome this evening to Web Slinging and World Changing, career guidance from Spider-Man, the Puritans, and a hospital janitor. But you're all curious. Um, this is the culminate, culminating presentation of Senior Week, the Career Center's annual event designed to prepare students for life after graduation. I hope all of you got to lots of wonderful presentations this week. Tonight's special keynote presentation is co-sponsored by the Center for Career and Calling, the School of Business and Economics, the School of Psychology, Family and Community, and the Center for Scholarship and Faculty Development's SERVE program. Before we get started, I wanted to invite you to stay after tonight's presentation. We're going to have a reception in the foyer. There's, there are some books for sale, and our guest has agreed to stay and visit, answer questions, and sign books. So that will be from 8.30 till 9 o'clock tonight. So our guest tonight is Associate Professor of Psychology at Colorado State University and co-founder and Chief Science Officer of Jobsology. It's an internet-based assessment system that matches employers and job seekers, and I'm sure he'll tell you more about that. He's co-author of Make Your Job a Calling, How the Psychology of Vocation Can Change Your Life at Work, and that's the book we have for sale tonight. He's also co-editor of two books, Psychology of Religion and Workplace Spirituality, and Purpose and Meaning in the Workplace. His research is in the area of career development, especially perceptions of work as a calling. And he also serves on the editorial boards of six research journals. He's a recipient of the Early Career Professional Award from the Society for Vocational Psychology. We're very delighted to have him tonight. Please help me welcome our very special guest, Dr. Brian Dick. Thanks, Karen. Appreciate the warm introduction, and uh, thanks to all of you for taking time out of your busy evenings to join us here tonight. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about this guy. Do you recognize him? You're right. It's George Carlin. No. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Sigmund Freud, who's very famous for saying many outlandish things and also a bunch of profound things, including this. Love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. Now, I'm going to focus our time tonight on work, but I thought I would start by talking a bit about love, and romantic love in particular, because I know how much college students appreciate receiving unsolicited dating advice. <laughs> now, I'm going to um, talk specifically about what to do on a first date. A lot goes into... Uh, getting a first date with someone. I'm going to gloss over that and instead focus on what to do during a first date. There are really two main objectives on a first date. One is to make a really good first impression, and the other is to figure out if the person you're on the date with is worth going on a second date, and third date, etc. Which is challenging because you recognize that that person also is trying really hard to make a good first impression. Right? Now, do you recognize this? This is a Rorschach inkblot. Now, Freud didn't come up with this, although it's related to some of his ideas. The idea with the, the inkblot test is you show a series of cards with these inkblots, an ambiguous stimulus, and you invite a psychotherapy patient to describe what they see in the inkblot uh, without censoring anything, just say whatever it is that comes to mind. And the idea here is what they say will reveal key information about their subconscious and the inner workings of their psyche. Now, this kind of thing can be helpful on a first date. I do not actually recommend that you administer the Rorschach on a first date, uh, unless you're both psych majors, in which case maybe it would be kind of a fun exercise. Uh, but instead, I would suggest uh, a simple open-ended question that might play the same role, okay? And that would be this one. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, if I asked a question like that on a first date, I would no longer be trying hard to make a good first impression, which is, of course, true. However, if you permit a little bit of your inner nerd to surface, 
uh, and roll the dice, take the risk, and ask this question, the answers you get will be very valuable in figuring out if the person that you're on the date with is worth going on a second date and so forth. Now, I have some hypotheses. These are untested hypotheses about how the person's answer will um, correspond with meaningful information about their personality and so forth. So if you're looking for um, a senior project, a thesis, and you're a social science student, please test these hypotheses and email me what the results are. But here's what I would suspect. If a person, in response to that question, answers with uh, some kind of power related to physical feats, like leaping tall buildings in a single bound, or the superhuman strength of Incredible Hulk, then this person is either very athletic or conversely not at all athletic <laughs> um, and is trying to overcompensate for that. If a person talks about a power that involves controlling the elements, like magnetism with Polaris or the weather, like storm, um, then there is a high need for control. You've got somebody here with a God complex uh, and a high need for power. Now this might be a red flag, but this is the kind of valuable information you would get in this scenario. If a person talks about changing physical form, changing size, like the atom or Colossal Boy, do we have any Colossal Boy fans out there? Um, or if they talk about uh, changing shape, like Mr. Fantastic, or worse, taking the form of other people, like Mystique, then you've got somebody who is uh, not particularly comfortable in their own skin. They're not satisfied with who they are, they want to be someone else, they don't like their appearance, they want to appear differently. Um, so this, this um, might be a, a high investment, kind of high need sort of person, so beware. Now if a person talks about superhuman speed, like Flash or Dash, <laughs> this conveys information about what they are expecting from the relationship in terms of how fast the relationship will move. Now, again, this is valuable information. If someone shares these superpowers, you might consider heading in the opposite direction. Now, if somebody says x-ray vision, I think the motivation behind that is obvious. Um, and so is also something that you should be aware of and be concerned about. Now, all of these things have been fairly negative, right? Uh, but this isn't only a way to find out valuable negative information about someone. For example, if someone talks about Batman, this is actually a positive thing. Batman is one of the few superheroes to actually not have any real superpower, okay? Um, he had a lot of martial arts training, huge bank account, access to all kinds of cool gadgets, but he didn't actually have any real superpowers. So if someone talks about Batman, then you know that this person is an overachiever. But of course, you already knew that because this person is on a first date with you, right? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Well, I, I lead with the superhero metaphor because I think it's a valuable one that translates into how we think about work. And specifically to illustrate that, you can talk about Peter Parker. Now you'll notice that, sorry, you'll notice that I have the Tobey Maguire version of Peter Parker here instead of the Andrew Garfield version. Um, that whole rebooting that series so soon, it just seemed uh, like more time should have elapsed. So I prefer Tobey Maguire. Um, but you know the story with Peter Parker. You've got this uh, bright kind of nerdy kid interested in science, working for the school newspaper. He goes on this fateful uh, class trip a radioactive spider falls on him and bites him, and then suddenly he notices very rapid changes. His physique changes quickly. He notices that he has this kind of spidey sense. Um, he has suddenly the capability to walk vertically along walls. Um, he has these gifts. He suddenly has these very distinct, unique gifts. And he wrestles with this question, I have these gifts, what do I do with it? Now he had options. He could have chosen to become a super villain. Um, but let's assume that those of you here in the audience um, don't lie awake at night thinking about ways you can dominate the world and cause widespread human harm. Um, and so like Peter, you might consider other options. 
Now, he did try wrestling, if you recall. I think he had the last three minutes um, with uh, this guy in the ring. And if, if he did that, he got 300 bucks or something like that. Actually, in the original uh, comic strip, Spider-Man also signed a deal with, not Spider-Man, Peter Parker also signed a deal with a, a, a television company and starred in his own television show where he used some of his abilities in that way. Now, those seem like reasonable things. But as the story goes, um, Peter's uncle Ben was murdered. And as Peter tried to cope with that, he kept coming back to um, Ben's words of wisdom to him. Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, so as he continued to reflect on those words and thinking through this question, I have these gifts. What do I do with them? He decided that what he could do with them was, in addition to tracking down Uncle Ben's murderer, fight the crime elements in the city where he lived and contribute to the well-being of the community in that way. Um, now that really, I lead with that because that ultimately is the question that each of us has to address for ourselves. You're unique people. Uh, you have gifts that uh, other people don't have that make you unique, distinct from others. What are you going to do with it? Here's how I'll structure the time that we have tonight. I'll start by talking a little about what a calling is. What is a calling? And what difference does it make? And so if you will permit me the chance to review some research related to that, I will indulge you. Um, the second theme will be common myths and misconceptions um, that Christians in particular tend to have about what it means to discern and live out a calling and, and how, what are some good ways to approach that process. And then we'll end with this question, what is your niche in God's kingdom and how do you live it out? What are some ways to think through that? So what is a calling and what difference does it make? Uh, it's an interesting question because you've seen kind of a resurgence of calling in popular culture in recent years. So Monster.com, for example, which is uh, the largest website for job seekers and employers, um, had as its tagline for a time, there we go, your calling is a calling, which is an interesting way to think about it. Um, Oprah, of course, loves the concept of calling, although it's difficult uh, to get her to endorse a book written about calling. Um, she, does, uh, <laughs> explore this, uh, she does explore this theme in her uh, magazine frequently, as is the case here. And if you Google commencement address Oprah, she hammers home the concept of calling every time she addresses a group of graduates. The Dalai Lama. Uh, speaks to this concept of calling in his book, The Art of Happiness at Work, uh, describes it as something that is closely linked to the Buddhist concept of right livelihood. Um, the father of positive psychology, Martin Seligman, devotes a chapter in his best-selling book, Authentic Happiness, um, to calling. And if you walk through any bookstore and look at the career section, you'll see books like this, Live Your Calling, Let Your Life Speak, The Call, if you're looking for recommendations, I might offer this one. <laughs> but if you're, if you're looking for um, a, a broad reading of, of all of these works on calling with, with the goal of figuring out what calling means, you'll run into the, the Rorschach inkblot scenario again. Um, because what you, what you recognize quickly is that people use the word to mean a lot of different things. And when they define it, their definition often reveals pretty key information about their worldview commitment. Now, one distinction that's been made in the research literature is between modern views of a calling and the neoclassical views of a calling. And here's the question that highlights this distinction. Is a calling an internal drive toward meaningful work that is self-fulfilling? In other words, if I want to find out what my calling is, do I look inwardly uh, and figure out what is going to make me personally the happiest? Or is it an external summons to do meaningful work that serves the greater good. Now, as, I, as I've approached this question, I, I have made the argument that the word calling, um, if the meaning of words matter to you, then you have to pay attention to what the word means literally and the way that it's been used historically. 
And so to me, the word calling implies a caller. In a religious country like the United States, for a lot of people, they identify the caller as God. But perhaps it's for other people something like a, a social need uh, or a family legacy or something like that. But anyway, it involves this transcendent summons um, that aligns a sense of purpose at your work with a broader sense of purpose in life um, that is principally not for your own happiness, but it's about what you can contribute to the world around you. So those three things, the transcendent summons, this connection of work purpose with life purpose, and a pro-social orientation. Now, at a campus like SPU, you can talk very explicitly. You have the freedom to explore what this means as Christians, right? And, and you know that our God is a God who calls. He calls us to himself, and he calls us to engage his world. And the key question that you have the privilege to explore together in community is, what does that mean for us? Now, often, uh, if you read theologians and how they talk about calling, they talk about different levels of a calling. So there's the general call. God calls people to himself into a relationship with Christ and a life of discipleship. Then there's the specific calling. Like, what am I called to do in terms of using my gifts for his glory to make a difference in the world around me? That might be the vocational call. And then there's the immediate calling. Like, what am I called to do right now, in this moment, in this situation? And uh, I'm going to focus tonight on the specific calling. As it applies to the work role in particular, what is your calling? How do you discern it? How do you live it out? So let's take those same three dimensions that I mentioned earlier and be explicit about it from a Christian perspective. Applied to work, and I think the concept of calling does apply to areas of life other than work but let's focus on work tonight. Applied to work, the specific calling is a summons from God to approach a particular occupation, and we'll define occupation very broadly, paid or unpaid, in a way that aligns one's purpose for work with one's purpose in life, and that glorifies God and contributes to the common good. You feel comfortable with that? So we're on the same page as far as what a calling means in the Christian context? Now, the next step, if you're uh, wired to think like a social scientist, is to say, okay, well, now that we've defined something, let's measure it. Uh, and in fact, although I will spare you the gritty particulars, um, some colleagues and I have uh, had the opportunity to design a scale to measure calling. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about this, but I wanted to include it on the slide, so you can, like me, admire the elegant beauty of a <laughs> measurement model. Uh, or, or at least uh, real science is happening here. Um, anyway, um, this gives you a flavor of what the scale is like. So there's a one to four scale, from not at all true of me to totally true of me. And there are 24 items that measure presence of calling and search for calling across those three dimensions. Here are three of them. I was drawn by something beyond myself to pursue my current line of work. My work helps me live out my life's purpose, and making a difference for others is the primary motivation in my career. Now, if you tended to agree with those statements, maybe indicating a three or a four to many of them, then you'd be somebody who we would say um, seems to have a strong sense of calling. If those are not at all true of you, then it's something that's irrelevant. If it's only mildly true of you, then you're lower in this sense of calling. So once we have those scores, we add them together, and that gives us a number we can use to then see how scores on a measure of sense of calling correlates with scores on measures of all kinds of other interesting things. That allows us to answer this question, what's so good about having a calling? What we find is, first of all, with students, with college students, scores on that measure and other similar measures of a sense of calling correlate positively with scores on all kinds of positive things about career development. So people who score high on the uh, sense of calling tend to um, feel that they're really in control of their career development. Uh, there's a concept called career maturity, meaning they tend to be sort of on top of the career development tasks that are expected given their level of development. 
They're very self-efficacious. In other words, they're very confident in their ability to successfully navigate the career decision-making process. They have a high degree of self-clarity. They have a high degree of hope for their work, optimism for their career path in the future. And they're very satisfied with their current um, place of study, program of study, academic major. Now when we look at this question with employed adults, we see a similar pattern uh, where a sense of calling is related to job satisfaction, it's related to how committed people are to their career and to the organization where they work, it's related to how meaningful people experience their work, uh, to how attached they are to the organization, and it's negatively related to withdrawal intentions, meaning the more people sense that they have a calling, um, the less likely they are to be looking for other opportunities beyond the one that they currently have. It's also related not just to career development outcomes or criterion variables, but to general well-being um, criteria. So a sense of calling is related to a sense of satisfaction with life as a whole. It's related to a sense that life is meaningful, not just my work, but my life as a whole is meaningful. Um, and people who sense that their work is a calling tend to cope more effectively with obstacles that they confront. Now one question that emerges from this is, is it enough to perceive a calling? So maybe you get to a place in your career development where, okay, I feel like I have a calling. Is that enough? Or does it really, um, is it really important to actually have an opportunity to live out that calling? And so we developed a scale to measure living a calling, which is different than perceiving a calling. And what we find is that they're correlated 0 0.50. Now, for those of you who have taken, taken statistics, you know what a correlation coefficient is and how to interpret it. Uh, for those of you who haven't or who are a little rusty, I'll fill you in. A uh, correlation coefficient is a numerical index of the strength of relationship between two variables, ranging from one to negative one. The closer to positive one or negative one, the stronger the relationship between variables. The closer to zero, the weaker the relationship. Now, in the social sciences, even though we get made fun of for it, we tend to get really excited when we see a correlation of about 0.3 or higher. We get Twitter pated, our pulse starts to increase, we feel like there is something meaningful going on. And so a correlation of 0.5 is a pretty strong correlation by social science standards. But it's not a perfect correlation, it's not 1.0, um, it's not higher than 0.5. What that tells us is that uh, living a calling and, and sensing a calling, these are clearly related things, but they are not identical. They are distinct. And in fact, if you look at how perceiving a calling and living a calling correlate with some of these key outcomes, you do see a difference. If you look in this table um, at the coefficients in the middle column, perceiving a calling is related to work meaning, career commitment, job satisfaction, life meaning, life satisfaction between 0.23 and 0.48. That's a meaningful, statistically significant relationship. But it's not anywhere near as high as the relationship you see between living a calling and these same outcomes. If you notice that there, the coefficients range from 0.49 to 0.7. Very strong relationship. So it's not so much, perhaps, about having a calling. It's about living a calling. In fact, um, and we're getting to the end of our, the research segment of the program, so bear with me. If you look at how perceiving a calling and living a calling interact, now let me explain what you see here. Along the uh, x-axis, you have perceiving a calling, low, medium, and high. Along the y-axis, you have career commitment. What this pattern of results shows is that um, people who perceive a calling, or perceiving a calling is related to career commitment, but only for people who are high in living a calling. In fact, for people who say they're not living a calling, although this is not statistically significant, it's actually in the opposite direction, right? So people who are high in perceiving a calling, if they're not living it out, they're actually less committed to their career. You see a similar pattern with work meaning. This is actually a different figure, uh, but this time work meaning is, long, is along the y-axis. So you see that same pattern. Perceiving a calling is related to work meaning, but only for people who say that they're living a calling. All right, so all of this, well, let me summarize first. Your take-home points from part one. A calling is a summons from God toward purposeful work that glorifies him and serves the greater good. A sense of calling is linked to 
positive career development and also to general well-being. Discerning and living a calling are actually two different things. And benefits come not just from having it, but from living it. Are we good so far? Now this, of course, begs the question, so how do I discern my calling and live it out? I know this is senior week, so some may assume, hey, we're seniors. We've already figured out our calling. How many people feel that they've figured out their calling? Okay, so not very many. Okay, so we can talk about both of these because it's relevant for many of you. How do I discern my calling and how do I live it out? We'll start with three common myths and misconceptions that a lot of Christians tend to express as they think through this question. The first misconception is this one. To discern my calling, I should pray and wait for God's direction. To discern my calling, I should pray and wait for God's direction. So uh, I think prayer is very important. I would never discourage prayer. In fact, you should pray um, for God to reveal to you a sense of calling. Um, it's the waiting that can be problematic. Now, patience is a virtue, so patience is important. But waiting can be problematic when it's a passive kind of waiting when you're waiting for a burning bush type sign, an audible voice telling you what to do, and if you don't experience it, you just pray harder and beg for it to happen, and if it still doesn't happen, then you just pray harder. Now again, I don't want to discourage prayer. Prayer is essential. Um, but is passive waiting accompanying the prayer the best way to go? A lot of people want to experience something that Roger experienced. I'll tell, I'll tell you his story briefly. Now, Roger was, um, uh, his whole life, wanted to be a cop, a police officer. He loved everything about it. He loved the badge. He loved the uniform. He loved the car. He loved the feeling that he imagined cops must get from protecting people and preserving the peace. In fact, if you look in Roger's eighth grade graduation program, it says, career goal, I want to be a police officer. So Roger, in fact, pursued that career path. He went to school at Ferris State University in Michigan, go Bulldogs, um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, majored in law enforcement or criminal justice. Um, got a position with the Kalamazoo Township uh, Police Department and thrived in it. By all accounts, he thrived in it. He was equal parts firm and fair. He had a knack for de-escalating tense situations. Um, he was widely regarded as a very good cop, and in fact, he was recognized with promotions. Very quickly rose up, up the ladder until he was patrol lieutenant, which in that police department is second in command. So here he was, second in command, thriving, loving his job, uh, until something happened, something very dramatic happened. Um, he remembers it very clearly. It was a September morning. He was actually engaged in Bible study while having breakfast. And uh, he was alone in his kitchen, and then he heard a voice. Uh, it was real enough that he looked across the table to see if anyone was there. No one was there. But the voice told him, Roger, I want you to quit your job with the police force and enter the ministry. I want you to become a pastor. And here is the name of the person that I want you uh, that I want to replace you as patrol lieutenant. And here are the names of seven people that I want you to discuss this with. And then he listed the names of seven people. Now, um, this was naturally very upsetting to Roger. He was not exactly looking for something like this to happen. Uh, and so he drove to the, um, the department office. He kind of walked around like a zombie that morning, trying to avoid eye contact with people. Um, he then drove home for lunch, couldn't get his mind off it, shared it finally with his wife, and I think was hoping that his wife would say, well, Roger, maybe you ate something bad last night, or maybe you got a little too close to the LSD evidence from that raid. <laughs> um, but in fact, she said, well, if this is what God wants us to do, Let's do it. And so ultimately, Roger did follow through. And although I'm pretty certain he's never worn one of these, I needed a visual aid for <laughs> um, He has since been a, 
a pastor at three different churches over the last 20 years in three different states and thrives in that job now. Now, why do I tell you Roger's story? Well, remember, he was instructed to talk to seven people. And Roger didn't take this lightly. He had children at home. Uh, this is a pretty big lifestyle commitment that this would involve, quitting his job, giving up his income, enrolling in seminary, moving to another community with his family. Uh, so he didn't want to be impulsive about it. But he had these seven names. So he went to these seven people. And he, he, tell, he, he said, I didn't really know what to ask him. So I just told him what happened and then said, what do you think? And what did the seven people tell him? Well, this is what he got from the seven messengers. And I use that phrase, seven messengers, because it sounds kind of apocalyptic <laughs> and uh, felt appropriate. So one of the things he got was advice. And this piece of advice was, read What Color Is Your Parachute? Now, are, how many of you are familiar with that book, What Color Is Your Parachute? This is a classic uh, self-help uh, career development guide. It's the best-selling career self-help book of all time. Uh, number two, he got advice saying, meet with a career counselor and take some assessments. Number three, he got some advice, get input from a pastor. You're being called into a pastoral role. Maybe you should talk about this with a pastor. The fourth thing he received was a lot of encouragement and affirmation. These are seven people who Roger had a relationship with. They weren't random strangers. They were people who were in his life, who had his best interests in mind, and so offered a sense of support. The fifth thing that he received from the seven messengers was modeling. And I don't mean like a supermodel. Uh, I mean modeling as in they were, de they were able to demonstrate to him how one might go about making a career change because the common link across all of them was that all of them had gone through or were currently in the process of making a career change themselves. Now, long after I heard this story, um, it occurred to me um, that this actually corresponds very closely with what we know works in research on career interventions. Now, um, there was a study, a meta-analysis. Uh, if, if you're unfamiliar with the meta-analysis, I'll fill you in. A meta-analysis is a study where a researcher will comb the research literature for every study they can find that answers um, a single research question or one very similar to it, and then runs analytics to come up with a quantitative summary of the results across that whole body of research. And some researchers from um, Loyola, Sh Chicago, did that. And we're interested in the question, um, are career counseling interventions effective? The answer was clearly yes, they are effective. Uh, and more than that, what differentiates the career development interventions that are especially effective from those that are less effective? In other words, what are the critical ingredients? What really needs to be included in a career development intervention in order for it to work well? And what they found was five. There were five factors, five critical ingredients that the most successful interventions tended to include. The first one is written goal setting exercises. Well, if you know what color is your parachute, you know that it's laden with written goal setting exercises. Now, we know a lot about uh, goals being really effective in psychology, but there is something about writing them down that makes them particularly impactful. The second thing, uh, the second critical ingredient was individualized interpretation and feedback. Well, remember, Roger was told to meet with a career counselor and take some assessments, and that's, of course, exactly what you receive in that scenario, is individualized interpretation and feedback. The third critical ingredient is accurate occupational information. And if Roger is considering a switch Career, uh, in career path to that of a parish pastor, then talking with his pastor seems like it would make sense as a good source of accurate occupational information. The fourth is support building, building support from important others. And of course, he received a lot of encouragement and support from these seven messengers. And finally, modeling of successful career decision-making behaviors, and he received that as well. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see this kind of convergence between um, the kind of experience that Roger has and what we see in empirical psychological research on uh, what makes career interventions especially effective, I pay attention to it. I do. And so maybe instead of praying and waiting for an audible voice, it makes sense to pray but be active. And when I say be active, I mean engage in these kinds of things. 
set goals, write them down, go to a career counselor, take some assessments, get that feedback, seek out accurate occupational information, build support from important people in your life, don't make these decisions in a vacuum, make them as part of a community. Um, and look for help from mentors, for people who have gone before you and who have struggled with these same kinds of things. If you do that, you'll be doing the kinds of things that we know are very helpful when it comes to discerning a calling. So the misconception is to discern my calling, I should pray and wait for God's direction. A reasonable response would be, don't pray and wait passively, rather pray, but be active. Now second misconception. If I'm serious about my faith, I should consider ministry and missions before anything else. Um, now this, actually this way of thinking dates all the way back to Greek philosophers who had this very clear separation between um, the things of the mind and the things of the body and the material. And that kind of, that distinction sort of carried itself over across the centuries in the church where there's this very clear distinction between sacred and secular, where if I'm really serious about my faith, I should do spiritual things. I should do real ministry. Uh, and if I settled for a job in business or nursing or something like that, then yeah, it's okay, but that's really not as spiritual a job. Well, um, you can turn to the Bible for some guidance um, about career decision making. Um, you'll find a number of passages, including this one in the New Testament, that talks about spiritual gifts. Um, this passage from 1 Corinthians reads this way, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them. And in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So this and those other passages have this idea that people are different, they're gifted differently, and those differences matter in terms of what types of tasks they're best equipped to engage in. And the Bible also uses the metaphor of the body, where one part of the body um, can't say to another part, you're not important. All the different parts are important, but they have to work together in order to advance the kingdom, advance the common good. Now, if you are inclined to take this principle and generalize it um, to society and to the world of work, because all of these passages really are speaking to the church, if you wanted to generalize them beyond that, you'd be in good company. Uh, Martin Luther was among the first to do this. And by the way, I really do like this picture of Luther because he looks like such a normal guy, right? I mean, a little bit unshaven. I have students coming into my classroom all the time at Colorado State, stumbling in, who look just like this. Um, you're used to this picture, which, you know, you can see a difference there. I like the first one. I'm sure you do too. Anyway, Luther uh, was among the first to say, um, if you want to understand what your calling is, look around you and serve God faithfully within whatever station that you're in. He didn't see a big difference between sacred and secular. Any type of effort and work can be spiritually significant if approached in a way where you're glorifying God and serving other people. Now John Calvin took that idea and elaborated it a little bit further and then passed the torch to the Puritans. Uh, now the Puritans, uh, and here you see William Perkins and Richard Baxter looking very comfortable in the attire of the day, um, took these ideas and wrote very rich meaningful texts exploring them, which are very remarkable. Uh, and I'd recommend reading them. I said earlier today, I don't think you probably hear many people urging you to read the Puritans, but you should on work. It's very fascinating, interesting stuff. Um, and part of why I think it's so interesting is because it translates so well, even though this was stuff was written in the 17th century. It speaks to us very much today. Now, here's an example. This is speaking to that same passage we just saw. William Perkins saying, Paul shows the diversity of gifts that God bestows on his church and so proportionally in every society. So here you see this application from the church to society. And by reason of this distinction of men, and of course we can assume women, uh, partly in respect of gifts, partly in respect of order, come personal callings. Personal callings arise from that distinction which God makes between man and man in every society. Notice he's saying personal callings don't come from a burning bush or an audible voice, but personal callings come from the distinction between a man and a man. In other words, people are different, and paying attention to those differences 
matter, it seems to make a difference. Richard Baxter, sometime in the 17th century, wrote, it's not enough that you consider what calling and labor is most desirable, but, that, but you must also consider what you are fittest for, both in mind and body. So when Dustin Hoffman's character in The Graduate is told you ought to go into plastics, um, you know, it doesn't mean he should go into plastics just because it was a hot uh, industry in the 1960s. Instead, if he followed Richard Baxter's advice, he would pay attention to what he was the best fit for. Now, just as a very quick aside, um, Pope John Paul wrote an encyclical work um, some years ago, a few decades ago, uh, where he communicated essentially the same ideas that the Puritans advanced. And so this has led some theologians and philosophers to, to just sort of sit back and admire there's this ecumenical convergence, meaning within the Christian tradition, and as we've already talked about with Dalai Lama and so forth, even outside that, there is widespread agreement on some of these ideas. I think that's worth pointing out. Now, the next person we should talk about here is Frank Parsons. How many people have ever heard of Frank Parsons? A few, good, the career development people especially. Frank Parsons is uh, not the most famous guy in the world, but if you've studied career development, you know him because he is widely regarded as the father of vocational guidance, which is extremely ironic if you knew his own career path. So let me fill you in a little bit. Parsons graduated uh, from Cornell uh, Ivy League as an engineer, got a job straight out of school, which is a great outcome, right? He got a job with an engineering firm straight out of school, but the engineering firm folded about a year later because there was an economic downturn, business was bad, he lost his job. He needed something, and so he got a job as a laborer in a steel mill. Now Parsons was not the biggest, strongest, most robust guy, and so it was really hard work, and he absolutely hated it. Quit as soon as he could, retrained as a teacher, taught uh, in the public schools in Boston. While he was a teacher, he became active in the local literary society, where some of the other literary society members commented on his debating skills and said, you know, you ought to consider law. So he trained as a lawyer, um, studied for the bar exam, passed the bar exam, but worked himself so hard in preparation of it that he developed some kind of illness and upon medical advice moved to, Me to New Mexico where he lived in the open for three years. I don't know exactly uh, <laughs> what that means um, and the history is a little bit, um, little bit sketchy but anyway he lived in the open in New Mexico then returned back to Boston where he um, hooked up with a, a, a law firm and then moonlighted as a lecturer at Boston University School of Law. I would have loved to have sit in, sat in on that interview. I see in your, your resume that you lived out in the open for three years in New Mexico. <laughs> Tell me how that equips you to teach at Boston University School of Law. Anyway, um, after a time of doing that, he decided, um, he was very interested in politics, he decided to run for mayor of Boston. He lost with less than 1% of the vote. Uh, then took a job at what is now Kansas State University teaching social sciences. After three years of doing that, he was fired. Uh, and so finally he moved back to Boston where he persuaded a wealthy philanthropist to fund the Vocation Bureau of Boston, which opened in 1908, January of 1908 at Boston's North End. It was designed to be a social service to provide um, basic career and employment counseling to unemployed immigrants in Boston. So that opened in January of 08. Six months after that, Parsons fell ill, uh, became bedridden, and three months after that, he died. A tragic and sudden end, the victim of a kidney infection. So this, friends, is our father of vocational guidance. Um, his career path can only be described as a convoluted pattern of trial and error, and his actual experience doing career counseling amounted to a total of about six months. But Parsons wrote a lot of things down. And among the things that he wrote down were a lot of his ideas about vocational guidance. And those papers were collected by his friends after his death and published in this skinny little book called Choosing a Vocation. Now the key quote that is all the time cited in anything um, about the history of career development is this one from Parsons, where he outlines his deceptively simple three-step process to achieve what he calls 
the wise choice of a vocation. He says, in the wise choice of a vocation, there are three broad factors. Number one, a clear understanding of the self. Your aptitudes, abilities, interests, etc. All these different aspects of the self. Understand yourself. Number two, an understanding of the world of work, of different opportunities that are out there in the world of work. And then number three, true reasoning on the relation of these two groups of facts. So in other words, understand yourself well, understand opportunities in the world of work, and then find a match. Find a match. Okay? And this idea, put in print more than 100 years ago, actually still is foundational to what career counselors do with their clients. Now, you don't just have to take the word of the sages and scripture for it, although you should with scripture. Um, you can turn to science. What does science tell us about this notion of fit? Uh, well, here again, there's another meta-analysis. Some researchers at University of Iowa went through the research and looked at every study they could find that looked at how the degree of fit between a person and the work environment related to some kind of outcome. And they ran some analytics to come up with these quantitative estimates, and this is what they found. Now, here again, we have the correlation coefficient. Now, PJ fit, that's person job fit. So the degree of fit between a person and the job is related 0.56 to job satisfaction. The better the fit people sense between themselves and the job, the more likely they are to be satisfied. Remember I said social scientists, even though they get made fun of for it, tend to get really excited when they see a correlation of 0 0.3. 0 0.56 is very strong by social science standards. Um, PO fit, that's the degree of fit between a person and the organization. That's related to organizational commitment, 0.51. That's a strong relationship. At the team level, PT fit, person team fit, the degree of fit people experience between themselves and the team that they're involved in projects on is related to satisfaction with coworkers. And even at the one-on-one -on -one level between a person and the supervisor, the degree of fit between a person and the supervisor is fairly strongly related to how satisfied people feel with the supervisor they have. So all of this is to say, fit matters. Fit matters. And so, if I'm serious about my faith, I should consider ministry and missions before anything else. Well, you should consider ministry and missions if you're a good fit for ministry and missions. If God has gifted you in such a way that you are well equipped to use your gifts to serve him and to serve others through those roles. But, What's key here is that you understand your gifts first. How are you unique? And what needs are you best equipped to address? Okay, that would be a reasonable response to that misconception. Now the third misconception is this one. I might make the wrong choice and miss my calling. I might make the wrong choice and miss my calling. Now this is actually related, getting back to romantic love, this is related to the concept of the soulmate. There is one person who is marked out for me to be my soulmate, uh, probably another student at SPU. <laughs> and if I don't find this person, somehow I am doomed to a life of loneliness and misery. Well, same kind of idea between, or behind this misconception, I might make the wrong choice and miss my calling. Uh, if I choose the wrong major, somehow, uh, I'm doomed to a life of unhappiness working in a role that I'm a terrible fit for, that I'm always going to hate, and my fate, is, my fate is sealed. This way of thinking is captured in this obituary that was published in The Onion. 97-year-old dies unaware of being a violin prodigy. Um, usually with The Onion, you can stop reading after you see the headline, that's where the punchline is. But this one, I think it, it would behoove us to go a little bit deeper, so let me read some of the highlights. Rockford, Illinois, retired post office worker branch manager Nancy Hollander, 97, died at home of natural causes on Tuesday after spending her life completely unaware that she was one of the most talented musicians of the past century and possessed the untapped ability to become a world-class violin virtuoso. She is survived by two daughters, a son, six grandchildren, three great-grandchildren, all of whom will forever remain oblivious to the national treasure Hollander would have become had she just picked up a violin even once. <laughs> Hollander's son David says, 
we're really going to miss mom. She was such a gentle, sensitive, perceptive person unknowingly outlining qualities that would have infused his mother's interpretation of Mendelssohn's violin concerto with a singular haunting beauty capable of moving the most jaded souls. Now, um, is this the way things are? I mean, do we have this sort of um, latent uh, ability that will communicate to us uh, our calling that we might just be oblivious to, that we might just miss completely? Um, I don't think so. It might be that way if you think of calling as an event, an aha moment, a one-time thing that happens. You pray for a calling to be revealed to you, and boom, on one day, a Roger Visker type experience, it happens in one moment. But what's interesting, and this is actually something that emerged in our research, we looked at the relationship between um, scores on our measure of seeking a calling with scores on our measure of a sense of calling, presence of calling. Now you would think, or at least if you didn't know any better like we didn't, you would think that uh, people who don't sense that they have a calling are really active at seeking one. If the sense of calling is relevant to them, and they feel like they don't know what it is, they're probably trying really hard to figure it out. But once people sense that they have a calling, then they don't need to, to keep looking anymore, right? they've sort of achieved having a sense of calling, so they're probably not that active in seeking one. What we actually found when we looked at the research and how scores on these two measures correlated was that they were related 0.77. Now, if you'll recall, 0.3 is the point where social scientists get all excited. 0.77 ventures into the territory where two variables are redundant. You don't need to measure both of them, you can only measure one because they're so closely related, it's like measuring the same thing. And in fact, that became our interpretation. Discerning a calling is not a one-time event, but rather it's an ongoing process. Almost by definition, part of having a calling means you don't ride happily off into the sunset, but you are engaged in this ongoing process of continually seeking a calling. Asking yourself, am I doing uh, everything I can to use my gifts to glorify God and to serve people around me? Are there things that I can be doing other than what I'm doing now or in addition to what I'm doing now to maintain, to sustain, to expand my sense of calling? It's a lifestyle of ongoing reflection and exploration. It's not something that ends at a certain point in time. In fact, you get a sense of this when you look at people who end up in jobs that they wouldn't necessarily have chosen but that they not, nevertheless come to experience as something very, very meaningful to them. So for example, I often tell the story of a road construction flagger. Now, you've experienced these road construction flaggers. There is occasionally road construction in Seattle, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, a student one day, a graduate student of mine, came into my office. She said, um, you got to hear what happened to my husband this weekend. So she tells a story where her husband was driving, uh, I live in Colorado, and so uh, we have these mountain passes, and they're often two-lane highways that are nestled against the mountains, so they're very windy. And so he was ri uh, driving to Gunnison um, to meet up with his dad for a bike packing, or back packing trip um, in the wilderness up there. And all of a sudden, traffic grinds to a halt, and he realizes as he looks forward that um, there's road construction, and so the two-lane highway is closed off to a single lane, and um, you know the road construction workers waving people through. They're standing there with the sign that says "stop" on one side, "slow" on the other. Now, if you're in that situation, you see that coming. You really kind of are hoping that you will get through before they move the sign from "slow" to "stop." But he didn't quite make it. In fact, he was one of the first cars um, to have to stop after he switched the sign. It was a warm day. His windows were down. So he could hear what was going on outside, and the person in the car ahead of him asked the road construction flagger something like this. How can you stand this job? It has got to be the most mind-numbing thing imaginable. And I think if we thought about it, we might agree with that assessment. I mean, it's a long time to stand on blacktop, switching this sign from slow to stop. Um, you know, it might be like watching paint dry, except for the fumes would probably be stronger <laughs> from the asphalt. Uh, but the, the flagger perks up with enthusiasm, and he says, I'm glad you asked. 
I love this job. And let me tell you why I love this job. I love this job because I get to make people safe. I care about these guys behind me. I care about you and all the people in the cars that are now lining up behind you. And I get to keep all of you safe. I get to make a difference every day, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear of a story like this, where someone in that type of a job that most of us would not aspire to, nevertheless finds a way to clearly experience that kind of meaning and purpose, I pay attention. I find that inspiring, and I think, boy, if he can derive that kind of purpose and meaning from his work, what does that mean about me and how I think about my work? What does that mean about you? Here's the hospital janitor, janitor promised in the title. Um, this is another example of someone who was able to live out a calling doing work um, that is probably not something that most of us would aspire to. Um, this is Maggie Garza. She works at Poudre Valley Hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado, where I live. And uh, I've got children, four of them, young boys, and they hurt themselves all the time. We end up in the hospital every so often. And uh, on one occasion, we were in there, and um, our favorite person very quickly became the custodian who was assigned to our room, Maggie. Why? Well, because it was very clear that she took her job seriously. I mean, you know, she cleaned very well. Um, she took that seriously. She left immaculate cleanliness in her wake. But she also became very interested in us. She asked about our family. She doted on our little baby that we had with us. Um, she expressed empathy toward her son, who, who was ailing at the time. Um, so I got to talking with her. I, I said, you know, this is how long you've been doing this, that kind of question. She said, it's interesting. I get a lot of, I get a lot of um, my coworkers telling me I should apply for uh, a job as a translator, because she could speak English and Spanish equally well. And she said, but they don't understand how much I love my job. And the more I got to know Maggie, uh, in fact, I took her out to lunch a couple of times because I was so interested in how, how she uh, approached her work. I learned things like nurses and doctors would often call Maggie into the room when they were dealing with a patient who was very difficult to get through to. This was in the pediatrics ward. Because she had a knack for breaking the ice with kids. She would get them to laugh. When the nurses and doctors felt helpless, they would call in the janitor. Okay. Um, to do this. And um, when you talk to Maggie about what she did, she would say, my job, you know, they call it environmental tech to make it sound important. We just say we're in housekeeping. Um, but I care about my patients. And she referred to them, to us, as her patients. And in a very real sense, we were her patients. She was able to take what she did and link it to the broader mission of the hospital, which is helping sick people get well. She saw herself as playing a very important role in that whole process. And of course, she is playing a very important role in that whole process. And so that basic idea of taking what we are responsible for day in and day out and linking it to some kind of broader vision, some kind of purpose in life that matters to us, I think is something we can learn from. In fact, something that we can practice now, with whatever kind of jobs that you're doing to sustain, to sustain yourself through school. So I might make uh, the wrong choice and miss my calling. Well, your sense of calling likely will change over time. There are likely many pathways you could follow and still be faithful to how God has equipped you. In fact, you may be able to take a job you never would have chosen and transform it into something that resembles a calling. I think the lesson here is focus less on finding it and more on building it. Calling as an ongoing process rather than an event. Now social science can tell us that it does make a difference when people are able to take their daily grind and link it to some kind of broader purpose. But social science can't tell us what that purpose is. And for that we turn again to the scriptures. You know, what do we as believers, as Christians, what resources are there for us to lean on to help figure out how um, the work that we do links to God's purposes for us, to his story? Now, there actually are uh, a lot of theological resources 
that help us do that. I am not going to go through each of these. I just thought I'd put them on the slide so that you realize that there are a lot of different ways to think about this. I'll just share with you something that has been very helpful to me. And that is thinking about work within the context of the grand narrative of Scripture. Okay, you can think of the Bible as a story um, that consists of four acts, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Now, we read in Genesis, and this is the kind of the famous cultural mandate or the creation mandate in Genesis 1.28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves us on the ground. Now, this is before humans fell into sin. Um, this is God entrusting people with work, giving them work to do, saying, I want you to manage my creation. I want you to take care of my creation. Now, as the story unfolds, um, Adam and Eve fall into sin. Sin enters the world. That did more than screw up humankind's relationship with God. It tainted all of creation, every aspect. Everything became not the way it's supposed to be, right? But the story doesn't end there. Um, Jesus Christ came to earth, taught us how to live. He died uh, a gruesome death on the cross, was resurrected. And that resurrection offers redemption, not just between humans in their relationship with God, but between the whole of creation as it relates to God. Here is um, a passage, I'm not a fan of single proof texts, uh, but this is representative of, of themes in scripture, so I'll read it from Colossians. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself, not just people, but all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So Christ's death and resurrection Reconciled was God's way of reconciling to himself all things. And restoration refers to where we're headed, uh, when all things are made new. Now the question here is, this is God's story, as outlined in scripture, where do we fit in? Where is our part in this story? Um, and... 2 Corinthians tells us this, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now remember, we just saw that um, God through Christ's death and resurrection reconciled to himself all things. Now we read that we have the ministry of reconciliation. We are ministers of reconciliation. So that means that, to me, that means that instead of merely being managers of creation, we are partners in this redemption project. Okay, we are ministers of reconciliation. And Al Walter summarizes this so well in his masterful book that I recommend everybody read called Creation Regained. He says, if Christ is the reconciler of all things, and if we have been entrusted with this ministry of reconciliation on his behalf, then we have a redemptive task wherever our vocation places us in the world. And so I think thinking redemptively is where this leaves us as believers. I started with this question with the superheroes. Um, you have these gifts. What are you going to do with them? I, I will end with another question. And it relates back to this very simple story that I didn't make up uh, about three workers breaking up rocks. The story goes like this. Three workers are breaking up rocks and were asked what they were doing. The first one said, I'm making little ones out of big ones. The second one said, I'm making a living. And the third one said, I'm building a cathedral. And I think that's the question uh, that we have to live out in community together, what cathedral are we building? Thank you very much for your time and attention and for taking time out of your schedules to join us tonight. And I think there is 20 minutes or so um, of questions. If anyone has one, I'd be happy to try to address it.
Um, so you mentioned um, an online test for uh, your calling, for how well do you think your job measures your calling. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the online tests um, offered by career counselors about um, is this career right for you? I know there's a lot of them. And how do you think those relate to calling if they do? Well, that's a great question. Um, and there's a few questions embedded in it. So uh, bear with me. I'll try to answer them. And if I don't quite um, get there, then you can point out what part I missed. Um, what career tests, are, are career tests good? Are they effective? Would I recommend them? Something like that. Um, well, what I wouldn't recommend is Googling career test and then responding to the first thing that pops up and then um, assuming that that's providing meaningful information. Um, if, uh, especially if, if you've taken social science classes and, and you've learned about measurement, you, you know that there are good and bad ways to measure things. And if you're going to use a career test, a career assessment to help inform your decision making, which I do advise, it's, a, it's not the only source of information but it can be a very helpful source, um, then you would want to make sure that the assessment you're using has good support behind it. It's good evidence of reliability and validity. We, you could, there are whole entire classes offered at this university that help you uh, understand the nuances of that. Um, but I would say if you went to the Center for Career and Calling here, they have pre-screened instruments. You know, they're providing meaningful information that's supported by good evidence of reliability and validity. Or if you feel so inclined, you can go to jobsology.com and uh, for $4.99, that's $4.99, create a profile, um, would be another way. Do they link to calling? Well, I mean, the scale that I talked about um, is a scale that was designed specifically to measure a sense of calling. A typical career assessment are really more suited to help you um, put into practice that idea of fit. You know, we talked about Parsons, uh, and you know, his first step is understand yourself and how you're unique. And career assessments are very effective at that part of it, at helping you understand, um, you know, how you're different from other people, how you're unique, what your strengths are, and what the implications of that are for finding a career path that fits you well. Now, um, no test can tell you what you should do with your career. Every once in a while I hear someone say that, they'll say, oh, I took that test. They always say that test. I took that test. It told me that I should be a shepherd or something like that, you know, some um, career they consider very undesirable. Um, so, you know, you may get results that are surprising or funny. That's why it's useful to engage in that process with a counselor. Uh, but again, it's just, it's one important and valuable piece of information that you should consider along with other pieces of information. And doing that, I think, will be helpful in the process of discerning a call. Hi, I'm Kelsey. Hi, Kelsey. Um, so what is the relationship between strengths and what you feel called to do but you don't feel equipped with at the moment, where you feel like there's definitely like you would have an affinity or a passion for a certain area but you're not currently it perhaps the skill set does not come simply to you or naturally to you mm -hmm. that's a great question um and that uh, is a long complicated answer so how can i um it depends a little bit on what you mean by strengths now of course there are plenty of examples of, of people doing um, starting off on careers that maybe they weren't best equipped for when they started you know sometimes people who don't fit the mold end up being innovators in a discipline and that's an important thing to remember that I need to re remind myself a lot because I tend to emphasize fit um, I do think there are ways to measure abilities that don't necessarily um, express themselves in specific skills yet. So there are still tests that you can take um, where you might gain a sense that you have an area of ability that's relatively untapped, which means um, if you were to pursue training related to that ability, you probably pretty quickly would develop the skills related to it. Um, what was I going to say related to that? must not have been too important because it's not coming back to me right now. Um, in general, 
abilities, strengths um, are pretty stable. And so that's why uh, I think it's a good idea to pay attention to things that you're good at, listen to feedback that you get from other people, um, maybe take an assessment or two, and pay attention to where the high scores are, because those are the areas that you're most likely um, to experience as you know, something that would come easy to you, that kind of a thing. So in that sense, I think it really is important to pay attention to strengths. But you're right, I'm not, I'm not gonna stand here and say that there may be some things that you're interested in that you don't feel well uh, equipped for. I mean, you hear the saying a lot, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. I actually think God does often call the equipped um, and equips the called. Um, but, you know, at the same time, there are, there are scenarios in which following something that you don't feel an affinity for may not be the best idea. I mean, there was a time in my life when I, I felt, I, I wouldn't have put it that way, but I, I really wanted to, you know, play in the NBA. Um, and uh, although I tried to squeeze every ounce of ability I could out of my limited um, set of talents, it was clear it's just not ever going to happen. Um, so, you know. And so a long meandering answer to your question, but uh, it reflects, I think, the ways that I would think about that. Hi, how did your personal faith affect uh, your career path? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, that part about calling being an ongoing process is one that uh, resonates with, with me because it reflects my experience. I mean, I fairly obsessively think about those questions. Am I doing what I can uh, to make a difference, to use my gifts to glorify God and serve people around me? Um, I think at every step in the way, uh, of the way, I, I have um, I've made plenty of mistakes, but I've tried to think of it in terms of, you know, am I doing, Lord, what you've called me to do? Am I being a good steward of the gifts that I have? I think the challenge that we run into, this could have been another misconception, is that sometimes you want those answers to be so specific. You know, should I take this elective next semester or that elective? What am I called to do? Uh, you know, or should I pursue counseling psychology, which ultimately I did, or should I pursue social work or sociology? I think we can um, get off track if we try try to get that level of specificity from it. I think God equips us with tools that we can, uh, or with gifts that we can express in probably multiple different pathways. I think he gives us the freedom to choose one, um, or to choose more than one. And once we do that, the question becomes, am I using my gifts in this sphere, in this domain, in my little corner of creation here? And, am I using my, whatever it is, am I using my gifts to serve him? Um, now, I, I wouldn't hold myself up as a, an example of someone who's always uh, approached things from the right way, but uh, that's something that, um, I know it's kind of a vague response, but that's something that I've tried to do yeah, with the help of Christian community, which I also think is important. Maybe one or two more questions? Hi, can you just explain what Jobsology is? Well, thank you for that question. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a new company based, uh, kind of spun off from Colorado State based on some research that myself and a colleague had been involved in. Um, the vision is for it to be an eHarmony for job seekers and employers. Uh, that's the vision. What it is right now is a career assessment portal uh, where you can log on, take some assessments, get some feedback uh, that can hopefully help inform your career decision making. And then if you consent, we can store your data. And uh, at some point, you may be pinged with an email saying, you've been identified as a good fit uh, for a job with this employer. Are you interested in being considered? Uh, and so we'd like to be able to use it to broker relationships between uh, job seekers and employers. Smooth the paths for people to find opportunities to live out their callings. I mean, that's really how I think about it. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is what it is. Yeah. But we do have a website, <laughs> www.jobsology.com. <laughs> yeah. Does that make 
makes sense. Yeah, does it help you? Sorry. So, like, for example, I know I want to be an interior designer. So does the assessment you were talking about, would it help me, like, narrow down that? Or is it just really broad if you're really not sure where you want to go? Well, what um, you could take the job psychology assessment and then um, it will actually predict occupations that would be a good fit for you based on your pattern of scores. One thing you could do is actually enter in interior design and see how your scores match up to that of typical happy interior designers. That's one option, but another thing that you might try is find people who are interior designers and who like what they do and um, take them out for coffee and say, can I have half an hour of your time? You might feel like that's an inconvenience, but I find that people in general tend to really like talking about themselves. And so um, I would do that and what you might find then if you do that with more than one interior designer is maybe there are more than one paths to finding employment in that area. You might get some kind of insider's advice. You might even get some access to opportunities you wouldn't have before. Um, but you know, there's a lot of jobs where people, once they, they land there, when you look back, you realize that there's not one path you need to take in order to find that. It differs from job to job. I mean, if you wanted to be a civil engineer, you kind of need to train as a civil engineer. Um, but you know, I, I don't know a lot about interior design, but that's where I'd start. Talk to people who, who do it, who enjoy it, and see what advice they would offer you. Do you have any further advice on choosing your immediate calling? I think that seemed to relate a lot to that, but anything specific? Your immediate calling. Um, now, do you mean the way I, had, I said before, like what should I be doing right now in this moment? Uh, you know, that, that's sort of like, um, it's, you might be thinking, let me try to. I'm looking for just uh, some helpful tips in that besides what you've already given. Okay, like for what you should do first? Mm -hmm. uh, like right after you graduate, do you mean, or what? Or in general. I mean, I. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I graduated a while ago, so. Congratulations. Yeah. The old guy. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't, I, uh, okay, so immediate calling. I, I, when you say immediate calling, I just wanna make sure I understand the question appropriately. You mean what? Well, when you started out the lecture, you talked about the three different yeah. general, specific, immediate. Yeah. And so we, I, I thought that you said discerning specific was what most of the lecture is about. Right. That's and so true. Then when she talked about her, her question was kind of like, okay, I know what I want to do generally. How do I find my way to specifically within that? So maybe she's. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Um, so that, that helps me. More focused. Right, okay. So immediate calling, the way theologians, some theologians talk about it, it's more about what should I do like in this moment? You know, like I'm in this situation, I see strangers in front of me, how should I help, you know? Uh, my advice would have been pray without ceasing. Um, but uh, for that question, I would um, take some pressure off yourself a little bit and recognize that, uh, you know, focus on job crafting, especially when people are about to enter the workforce, um, I know of almost no one who got their dream job right out of the gates, right? Uh, and, and so the question is, what opportunity can I find right now um, that gives me a chance to use the gifts I have to make a difference that might also provide a pathway to lead to something else in the future? Um, you know, it's very, very common to change jobs, even to change career paths. Um, you know, the, the old days where uh, someone would come back from the war, get a job in a company, and spend their whole lives within that company, those are long gone. That is definitely the exception now, not the rule. And so, you know, to answer that question, I would say, don't overthink it. Um, I think recognize that God gives you some freedom. Uh, and to go back to Luther, um, whatever, wherever you find yourself, serve God faithfully there. And I would project a little bit more into the future and say, okay, where is this leading? How can I use my experience doing this, whatever it is, um, to move into something uh, that, that aligns with the sense of purpose that I see for the future? Um, but don't, um, I think a lot of people feel paralyzed. They put a lot of pressure on themselves to come up with something really specific right now, and you don't have to do that. Yeah. yeah. 
Do you personally feel that every single job can, it, um, can be considered kingdom work? I would say that every honest area of work can be a calling, can be considered kingdom work. Now, I always have to qualify that a lot. Okay, so that, 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 um, that leaves out not honest areas of work, um, the pimps and the pornographers, uh, you know, um, and it raises questions like, is manufacturing cigarettes kingdom work? Uh, you know, there's all kinds of murky issues. Or how about, how about an assembly line? How about work where you are doing one task over and over again, you're pretty far removed from the, the fruit of your labor. Uh, you know, I mean, there are very provocative questions around that. I think there are ways to approach even jobs like that as kingdom work, based on building community with your coworkers and so forth. Um, so it's really hard to answer that question briefly. I, I would say in general, yes, with some caveats and qualifications. And, and just while you're bringing the mic there, I would say, if you believe that Christ is Lord over the whole of creation, then that, that idea lends support to the notion that everything could be kingdom's, kingdom work. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. If, if, you, if you believe that Christ is Lord over all of creation, the whole of creation, that belief lends itself to the idea that, that virtually everything can be kingdom work. But I also believe that we live in a fallen world, and mm -hmm. so I wonder if some jobs are just a result of that. Well, we, yeah, and well, we could have a whole course on this too. We, we do live in a fallen world, um, but not totally fallen. You know, there re, there's a sense in which there remains this uh, remnant of, of the created intent. And so the whole idea of, of redemption and of where we're headed to the new, you know, the new earth, you get eschatological and so forth, I think gives us the sense that um, we can, whatever our corner of creation is, we can think redemptively about it. What can I do to use my gifts to move this little corner of creation, however big or small it is, in the direction that God intended it to be? Um, okay. So uh, we've been talking a lot about fit and um, what people want to do and what they're passionate about and what their skill set is and things like that. But um, as much as I feel like I'm trying to find what I want to do and what my calling is, I feel like I'm finding more what I don't want to do and what I don't feel called to do. Um, and so regarding fit, I don't know if you have a direct answer for this, but we're like, is fit going to be this hyped up thing where people are just like, oh, this is definite. Like, I feel like we're, we make it, or in, in general, like, people say, this is my passion, but like, mm -hmm. is it just going to be more that you know that you're happier than what you were doing? Because then you're just climbing the ladder higher and higher until yeah. you Yeah, you're feeling frustrated because for you it's like process of elimination. Yeah, exactly. You consider everything and you don't like it and you go to the yeah. next thing you don't like it. And if it's elimination, I don't think that that's calling, then that's just finding something better. Well, yeah. Um, I don't know that finding a fit, um, I mean, you can, you can get to the point where you, you, you start to think of finding a fit as that audible voice. Like, I'll find this, this, um, this job and finally that will be it. You know, I will know that I found it when I found it because my spirit will soar and that kind of thing. I, I don't think it's that way for most people. It is for some. You can talk to people and, and it sounds like that. But I think for most people, they find something that seems to align reasonably well with their gifts. They um, forge a career path in that domain and, and as they move forward in it, they recognize, okay, yeah, this is something that um, I can be successful in, that I enjoy that satisfies my values, that gives me a sense that I'm contributing something. Um, you know, I, I get a little bit skeptical of, of people who are chasing uh, a sense of passion because I think a sense of meaning um, is not necessarily the same thing as a sense of passion. Right? You don't have to feel ecstatic about what you do in order to feel that what you're doing is meaningful. Um, so I would encourage you to go to the Center for Career and Calling to explore this further with a career counselor. Yeah. 
Great questions. Okay, so we're going to uh, give Brian a moment to have a drink of water. We have refreshments out there. There are books out there. And you're welcome to stay another half an hour, more conversation, um, and come talk to some of the career counselors here, too. We're all, uh, there's about five of us here. So let's thank Dr. Brian Dick one more time. <laughs>